Hello there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I'm going to be revisiting the Dell D620 ATG laptop that I made a video on back in February. In that video, I installed Windows 10 on this laptop to see if it would be able to function acceptably for some basic tasks. I had my reasons for choosing Windows 10 in that video, but many people either disagreed or were just interested in seeing some different operating system options. So in this video, I'll be trying to try out some different operating system options on this laptop. I mainly ended up using Linux though, because of a few hiccups with the other operating system options that people were interested in. Those other options were Chrome OS Flex, as well as a lightened version of Windows, by the way. However, before we get to the OS testing, let's give this laptop a little service. It's pretty dirty, as some people have pointed out and disliked in the last video, and so I'll be trying to clean it a little more right now, but a lot of the dirt on this laptop is really caked on, and I'm not too concerned about restoring this laptop to a beautiful condition, because I don't plan to use it for anything. I'll try to clean the outside of it, the keyboard, and the inside of it around the heatsink here. The one thing that I'm not going to touch is the screen though. After posting the first video on this laptop, I learned that the reason that this screen is in such a disastrous state is because of a design flaw in the laptop. This is the ATG variant of this laptop, which is basically a beefed up, more durable version of the regular D620. There's an extra layer of protection on the screen in this version, and the glue that Dell uses to attach this layer oozes out and covers the entire laptop in a sticky goo that's quite difficult to remove. With my laptop, this glue hasn't spread out onto things like the keyboard yet, but it's definitely on and around the screen. Because of this, and how stubborn this glue has proven to be to remove, requiring a reasonable amount of elbow grease even with a decent solvent like 99% isopropyl alcohol, I'm not going to touch the screen for fear of making it worse. The screen isn't going to look pretty, but there's not really anything I can do about it. However, there is one thing that can be cleaned a bit better, and that's the keyboard. After wiping it down for a while with some alcohol, almost all of the cake on dirt on the top of the keyboard was cleaned off. I also wiped down the wrist rests, trackpad, and some other spots on the top of this laptop while I was at it. I'm not bothered with cleaning the inside of the keyboard because most of the dirt is really caked on in this laptop and I don't feel like deep cleaning this keyboard right now. And with a final cleaning of the outside of the laptop completed, it's time to start working on the internal components and getting them all cleaned up. The inside of the laptop was quite dirty when I opened it up in the first video to replace the RAM, but the dust didn't look like it was thick enough to affect the cooling system. In any case, it's still a good idea to clean the dust off of the heatsink and definitely a good idea to repaste the CPU, which I'm going to do now. Now this laptop is built like an absolute tank, which is something that cannot be said about a lot of modern machines. However, though having a beefy laptop like this is great for durability, working on this thing is nothing short of a chore. There are so many screws, thankfully there aren't too many different kinds of them, and taking it apart is like a puzzle. This laptop predates my time of working with computers, but I know that this is the kind of machine that most of you guys used to have to deal with all the time. Hearing me whine about how much of a challenge servicing this thing is might be a little bit funny to some of you, but to me, the design of this laptop is painful to work on. But hey, at least it's not glued together like some machines. In any case, after about 100 screws and a lot of prying later, I separated the display and top cover assembly from the bottom of the laptop where the motherboard and cooling system can be accessed. I removed the heatsink assembly from the CPU and the thermal paste was very baked onto the die. But with a bit of elbow grease and a lot of isopropyl, I was able to clean it up nicely. Interestingly, though there is a lot of dirt inside the laptop, it's a very fine dust that hasn't really blocked anything. The heatsink was pretty clean already, but I cleaned it a little more, and the fan was colored brown by the dust, but it was nothing that should affect its performance. So I skipped cleaning the fan, and applied some new thermal paste to the CPU, and remounted the heatsink. And finally, after about an hour of working on this laptop, getting it cleaned up a little and repasted, it was back together and ready to be used. However, before I put some different operating systems onto this laptop, there's a few things that need to happen. Number one, I need a break after all of that leaning over my workbench and tripod, and number two, I need to come up with a plan for what operating systems I'm actually going to try out. And I'm going to be honest, this old chair is not going to cut it this time. Look at this thing. It's rusting, it does not have good support for my back, and the seat is even tinted slightly blue from the amount of time I've spent sitting here in blue jeans. Plus, these holes that lead down to a metal tray at the bottom have almost been the end of a Lego set more than once. But thankfully for me, after years of using this chair, 
FlexiSpot has reached out to sponsor this video and provided me with their new C7 Premium Ergonomic Office Chair. This chair has lumbar support that's miles ahead of anything my old chair even attempted to provide, and it's also got a pretty wide range of adjustability for the angle and back of the seat, which I love. In fact, it can lean back far enough that I can pretty easily see myself falling asleep in it, which is impressive because I cannot usually fall asleep when I'm not in a bed. The C7 has a wide range of adjustability, with adjustable height, seat depth, and even a pretty cool forward-leaning position, which makes sitting for long periods of time, like when editing a video, very comfortable. Plus, the padded bottom of the seat means that I don't feel like my pelvis is poking through my bottom after I've been sitting for a while. And if you want more ventilation on the seat, there's also a mesh option. It's even got these adjustable armrests, which I found myself loving, especially as someone who's coming from a chair that doesn't have armrests at all. And the adjustable headrest is also an amazing feature. With the impressive versatility of the C7, including features such as a 20 inch wide seat that I can even sit cross-legged in, it can accommodate people who are 5 foot 4 to 6 foot 2 tall and who weigh up to 300 pounds. It's a perfect chair for almost anyone. If you're someone who spends a long time at a desk, such as a freelancer, finance professional, or an IT specialist, the C7 is a great investment to make in your working environment. Feel free to try it with its 10-year warranty and 30-day free return policy. Use the code C730 to save $30 on your C7, and I'll have links in the description and comments. And if the C7 is out of your price range, you can check out some of FlexiSpot's other chair offerings, such as their C2. All right, now that I've had a break and have been able to do my own research on some operating systems, let's get to work on this laptop. The first of two OS options that I settled on and will be trying to install today is Linux Mint. I settled on Mint, and more specifically the Cinnamon version. I'm not someone who uses Linux on my desktop systems, I only ever use it in headless setups for servers, and so I'm not incredibly well versed in the world of the Linux desktop. For that reason, I ended up with Linux Mint Cinnamon, and I'm sure there's a better option out there. But you're in the wrong place if you're looking for a perfectly executed Linux on very old hardware video, because this isn't what I specialize in. Mint Cinnamon is known to be quite user friendly, which is something that I value, and even though it's not the most bare bones and lightweight version of Linux Mint that's available, it should still be lighter than Windows. If this laptop still had 2 gigs of RAM in it, then a different version would have been a much more reasonable choice, but we have 4 gigabytes installed, so Cinnamon should be fine. And actually, now that I've mentioned the amount of RAM we have in this system, I should run over the key specs of it before I go further into Linux Mint's performance. This system is running an Intel Core 2 Duo T5600 with 4GB of DDR2 RAM. I'm installing the OS onto a 128GB SATA SSD, and all of the testing today will be done with the laptop plugged into AC power, just for the record. Anyway, I booted up the system, which wasn't the fastest boot that I've ever seen, but it could have been far worse, and logged in. I opened up the performance monitor to view what the idle RAM and CPU usage looked like. The idle CPU usage seemed to hover somewhere below 15% most of the time, and the RAM usage was almost spot on at 950 megabytes. After connecting the system to the internet, I did my best to ensure that the graphics drivers were updated based on what I could find online. It seems as though it should be fine, however I will reiterate, I do not use Linux on any desktop systems which have monitors hooked up to them and therefore require graphics drivers. So there's a reasonable chance that I've done something wrong here. In any case, I started out the testing by opening Firefox and heading over to YouTube. After opening a YouTube video, I found that at 720p, the system was able to play it back with an okay-ish performance. We were still dropping a reasonable number of frames, but this is performing better than the system did at 480p in Windows 10, so Linux has already won in this department. I decided to give 1080p a shot just for the fun of it, but can say that this system is not capable of doing 1080p YouTube, at least without any help. However, there is another thing that I want to try out on this laptop, and that is the h264 fi extension, which was brought to my attention by a couple commenters on the last video. YouTube uses VP9 to stream its videos, which is a codec that this laptop has no hardware acceleration for. However, h264 fi will convert this VP9 stream into an h264 one, which can be relatively easily decoded on the CPU of this laptop. And after the extension was installed, I tried streaming the same video at 720p again, and it seemed that we were dropping fewer frames than we were before installing the extension. I once more pulled up the system monitor to see what the CPU utilization was looking like, and we were between 50 and 75% utilization while streaming this video at 720p. Next, I set the video to 1080p, and the stream was almost smooth, but still hitched a reasonable amount. Still, this extension has greatly improved the streaming performance, especially at 1080p. The hitches in the 1080p stream also seem to be a result of the CPU in this laptop being insufficiently powerful to decode the H.264 stream. Next, I'll be moving on to using 
multiple tabs and browsing heavy sites, such as Amazon.com. This laptop was handling Amazon pretty well, and it didn't seem to be struggling with loading parts of the web pages quite as much as Windows 10 did. And when I had several tabs open for different listings, after they had all loaded, switching between them and comparing things was acceptably responsive. I will note that pretty much all of this lag can be seen as a result of the CPU's lack of power. An upgrade from this T5600 would probably benefit the laptop measurably, but that's going to have to possibly wait for a future video. Playing a video on the Amazon page was mostly fine, with only some small micro stutters, which is quite impressive. This is a little more of a subjective test, as I can't compare things such as the amount of frame drops or the maximum usable stream resolution as I could with YouTube. But this system seemed to be performing reasonably well in comparison to the Windows 10 system when shopping on Amazon. The Windows 10 system wasn't incredibly far off from this one in this test, but it seems that the Linux laptop has outperformed it by a small but meaningful margin, so the score is 2-0 at this point. Now I'm going to move on to my test of this laptop in a few browser games. In my last video, some people seemingly either misunderstood the point of the test or disliked my choice of game to test, which is fair. So let me reiterate that the point of this test is to ensure that the laptop is capable of running some simple-ish graphical applications with in a web browser. If the laptop has trouble with some of these tasks or ends up causing severe graphical artifacting while trying to execute them, that could become a problem on sites that use certain graphics, even ones that aren't games. I decided to start out this time with something that shouldn't be a challenge at all, chess. I'm not going to spend much time here, but needless to say, this system was able to run chess just fine. Also, please don't judge my chess skills. I've played about 10 times in the past three years, so I've forgotten all my good strategies. I also went ahead and upped the ante a little with some cool math games. I don't play cool math games, so I kind of just chose some random ones to see if the system would be able to render their simple graphics. I tried to play this one called Slice Master, however the system was clearly running into issues with regards to rendering it. This is what this game looks like when it's running on my main desktop computer, and as you can see, it does not look right on the laptop. I can't pinpoint whether this is an issue with the browser, OS, the Intel 945 chipset that's providing the graphics for the system, or just this game, but it seems like some graphics applications could have issues with a system of this age, which isn't too surprising. A different game, Run 3, worked just fine. It wasn't necessarily a good experience, but there wasn't any graphical glitching or any failures to render, so it seems that it may be localized to only some in-browser graphics. I'm not comparing the Linux Mint performance in this task to the Windows 10 performance in this task because I benchmarked different things on each laptop, and the main point of this test is just to get an idea of whether or not there will be compatibility issues with this hardware and the graphics on certain sites. There is one last test on this laptop that I'm going to be performing with Linux Mint, but I'm not spending more than several seconds here because it's pretty boring. In Google Docs, the system was perfectly responsive and the display didn't lag behind the keystrokes at all. The same goes for for Google Slides, where making slides with images and text was absolutely doable. Transitions were a little choppy though, so I'd maybe stick to simple dissolve transitions on your slideshows, rather than animated transitions if you're using this laptop to present your slideshows instead of just creating and sharing them. Overall, Linux Mint Cinnamon, which isn't even Linux's lightest weight showing, has beaten Windows 10 in pretty much every test. So, if you're someone who is comfortable using Linux on your laptop and wants to use one of these older laptops as your daily driver, I can say that Linux will give you a better overall experience than Windows will. All right, let's move on to the next OS option which I chose to do. And spoiler alert, this one didn't work out. I wanted to give Chrome OS Flex a try on this laptop. I know that a lot of people are going to be a little disappointed that I haven't gone with a lightened version of Windows, but as I looked into that option, I learned how much I disliked the idea of using a modified ISO. The more I researched it, the more skeptical I became of all modified Windows ISOs and don't really trust them enough to connect to my network and log into things such as my Google account to test docs and slides. Because of that, I did not try any lightened versions of Windows. However, I did want to give Chrome OS Flex a go on this laptop as it seems like an interesting option. I'm not a huge fan of Chrome OS myself but I can't fault that it's a relatively lightweight and user-friendly operating system. It's also a pretty browser-oriented operating system, so it should be relatively good at performing tasks in its built-in Chrome browser. Because most of the tasks that you can do on Chrome OS happen in the Chrome browser, it would make sense that it would be good with the Chrome browser. But sadly, when I went to install Chrome OS Flex, the system would boot to the drive, the Chrome OS Flex logo would appear, and then it would sit at a black screen and stop pinging the USB drive for data. I tried 
tried switching from UEFI to BIOS and vice versa. Quick editor me correction here, I misremembered when writing the script. I wanted to try to switch between UEFI and BIOS, but I believe that this laptop does not use UEFI, which means we only have BIOS. And I also remade the installation media on different drives of different sizes, but the issue persisted. There was frustratingly little information and troubleshooting steps to try on this issue available online, and after about two hours of messing around, trying to install this OS, I called it. I'm unsure of why this wasn't working, and I do wish that it had worked, as I was genuinely quite curious as to how it would have performed. All in all, today we were able to confirm that Linux is able to squeeze a notable amount more performance out of this laptop than Windows. Windows 10 was able to. So, Linux seems to be a very reasonable option for a laptop of this age, and Linux Mint Cinnamon, which is the exact version I used, was very usable and easy to navigate. And before I sign off, I would like to give one more thank you to FlexiSpot for sending over their C7 chair. Make sure to check them out at the links in the description and the comments. Well, that's all that I have for you in this video. I hope that you were able to at least enjoy it, and maybe even learn a thing or two. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.